the ocean is no place to be abandoned alone. This is the true story of two friends whose island hopping adventure becomes a fight for survival. Now one of them has to make the most difficult decision of his life. Await death with his friend or leave him behind and face the ocean alone. You don't leave your buddies. You don't leave your friends behind. the San Juan Islands in America's Pacific Northwest. It's a sea kayaking mecca. But every year, these waters claim the life of at least one sea kayaker. It's 3.45, folks, the end of a beautiful November day. A winter is on its way, so plan your weekend accordingly. The sea kayaking season is over, but endurance athlete Saul Kinderis wants to conquer the San Juans. Hey, Larry, it's Saul. Where are you, man? Get here. Saul and his track teammate from college, Larry Kaiser, are regular weekend warriors. But they've never kayaked together before. Our plan is to hit Strawberry Island, and after that hit Dobe, a 60s resort. It's got uh, two hot tubs, one cold tub, you know, um, clothing optional, which generally speaking means no, you know, nobody wears a stitch. The goal was to head there and take her clothes off and hit on women, basically. I mean, that was the goal. You're late, Larry. You're late, Larry. Four hours. Four? Four hours. I'm sorry, Saul. I just got stuck in that damn Seattle traffic. So are you going to be up for this? Yeah, I'm up for this. Fat tourists like you can do this sport. I don't see what the problem's going to be. I'm up for any kind of challenge like that, any kind of physical challenge, especially if Saul throws that at me. If he can do it, I can do it. And not only if he can do it, I can do it, but I can do it better. Yeah, competitive would probably be a defining and describing characteristic. We tended to compete in almost anything. Chop, chop, Larry. It's that kind of relationship that you know, kind of got us in trouble here in this situation. Hurry up, you slug. Get down here. Because Larry is late, they set out at night, something that even the most experienced kayaker wouldn't do, especially in winter. Women friends of mine would call it with a severe case of testosterone poisoning. And, uh, you know, the, the brain quits working because you just want to go. I slide you out, you hit the water, put your weight on the paddle, okay? I'm going to kick your butt, you know that. Put your weight on the paddle. It was unnerving setting out at night. People die every year kayaking in the San Juans. But that danger is exciting. It's a thrill. I'm thinking I'm invincible. Oh! <laughs> we have a winner! Larry and Saul are paddling off the coast of America's Washington state into the heart of the 176 islands that make up the San Juans. They're crossing a notoriously dangerous stretch of water, the Rosario Strait, on the way to their first destination, Strawberry Island. They need to cross quickly. Soon the tide will turn making it virtually impossible to land on the far side. I keep going to the left, huh? I keep going to the left. Yeah, well, adjust your rudder. The rudder? Yeah, with your foot pedals, you know? Foot pedals? What are your feet touching? Nothing. Nothing, are you sure? Yeah, I said nothing. Well, actually, if I, uh, if I stretch out my left foot... Oh, Larry, did you even adjust the foot pedals? Everybody adjusts their foot pedals before setting off. Yeah, I did. They just must have come loose or something. I'm just kind of trying to fake it. And that's the first time I'd set my ass in a kayak. I'd never been in one before. It started to dawn on me that Larry is a fake and expertise on the kayaking. That's when I started to figure, OK, we've, got, we've gone from a trip to an adventure. You know, looking back, I'm thinking, what the hell was I doing? What was I thinking? What sane and reasonable person would cut across a channel 
at night the first time in a boat. So not only were we doing my first winter trip, uh, we were doing a nighttime crossing, and we were enduring a storm. So anybody that would have known us would have known, you know, that was really stupid. Eventually, Larry and Saul reach Strawberry Island, but they're late. The only landing spot is a sandy beach surrounded by dangerous rocks. Now, in the darkness, they face the ferocious tidal currents swirling around the island, giving the area its nickname, the Witch's Cauldron. We're here. Witch's Cauldron. What? Strawberry Island is dead ahead. Where? Up ahead. Can you hear it? So all I hear is thrashing waves. Waves are smashing and crashing on the rocks up there. The wind is picking up. It's hard to hear. And it's just looking pretty nasty up there, too. And I'm just thinking, well, this doesn't look fun. This is the plan. There is only one beach on this island, only one slot in between the rocks. We can't miss that slot. I'll paddle in first. When I land on the beach, I'll wave my flashlight. That's your signal. We're gonna land on that. Aim for the flashlight and paddle hard. You got it? Larry, you got it? Yeah, aim for the flashlight. This was pushing my enjoyment factor. We were, we were starting to get outside the area and enjoy. I knew that I needed to hit that beach just right or life was gonna truly get miserable. I can see big, jagged rocks that don't look good to land on. It's just really hairy out there. The flashlight I have, you know, it's just not that bright. I see the rocks in front of me, and all I'm thinking is, oh, shoot. I'm yelling. I can't tell what he's doing. I'm just like, you know, what? You know, what? What are you saying? I can't hear what you're saying. Do not come in! Larry sees my headlamp kind of waving around a little bit, and so he's figuring I must be waving him in. Larry! I could see him coming in. He's aiming for the flashlight, just like I told him to, and that flashlight's on my head. our boats on top of us and on top of the rocks. Very scary situation. Totally caught us off guard. It just happened in a split second. You okay? What the hell was that? You tell me that! We crashed! We crashed! I can out of Get me the hell out of here! They gotta reach those books. You really need the book. Yes! We need them! Or we're dead! We just get the hell out of here! You don't get it, do you? We're not gonna get out of here! We'll we don't get that! We'll get out of here! Get out I'm realizing we're definitely in a survival situation here. And we gotta get our stuff up here. We got four days worth of food on the boats. Um, got enough fresh water for maybe two or three days. Without it, we're screwed. I thought you said there was a beach here. Yeah, well, I lost the beach. So how do you lose a beach? I misjudged it, OK? I got you. Just hours into their sea kayaking adventure, 
Larry and Saul have shipwrecked on a deserted island. I'm looking forward to getting warm. We could have been killed. But we weren't. As much as Saul and I both seek out these fun, dangerous, athletic situations, we don't have a death wish. Basically, at this point, I take my dry bag out, and my dry bag is no longer a dry bag. My dry bag is a soaked bag. All my stuff is soaked at this point, everything. Larry, what happened? All my stuff is wet. Well, obviously. Did you even seal this properly? This is broken. No, it's not broken. You didn't seal it properly. What the hell is all this? This is all cotton. How could you ever think for a winter trip packing all cotton? At that point, he was probably a little angry, and for probably good reason. My sleeping bag, all my clothes, all the gear I had, it's all just drenched. His stuff was fine. Get into this. This is your bed. I have dry clothes. I can sleep in them. Saul knows that in the cold and the wet, Larry's cotton clothes and his sleeping bag will take days to dry. By that point, I truly realized that my assumptions weren't correct on his level of preparedness. I'm the guide on this trip, and Larry was going to more or less along for the trip. If I got in trouble, he wasn't going to be able to help me because we were so far out of his element. So then I'd snuggle up against the outside of his sleeping bag. Guys, especially in your 20s, you're going to go damn near hypothermic before you'll cuddle up with another guy. He kept trying to nuzzle up to me. He was cold, and I'd get away, Saul. You know, what are you doing? You know, just keep, <laughs> throughout the night, he kept getting closer and closer, and I kept going farther and farther over this edge of the tent. I, I like Saul, but I don't like him that much. Larry, I am cold. You move one more time, I'm climbing in there with your naked butt. Got it? Larry and Saul's adventure was supposed to last nine days, but the weather is getting worse and Larry's gear isn't drying. So Saul makes a decision. I've rapidly realized the trip I planned isn't within our reach. Not for the two of us together. It's not going to work. It just wouldn't be a prudent thing to do. I just wanted to tell myself, you know, we still have time to have some fun and get this out of our system and use this as a small setback and just keep going. So we're still going to obey then. The trip is over. Your stuff won't dry. One of us will end up hypothermic. So the crash last night was totally my fault. It had nothing to do with you. Larry, man, we're bagging it. I agree. Hey, do I get a say in this? Because I agree with you. Start to pack your stuff up, we're leaving. The trip is screwed at this point, but he's the boss. He's the leader. Saul is the expedition leader. That's how he always is. He likes, he likes being in charge. Did you seal your dry bag? Yes, I did, Daddy. Okay. Boats in water. Hey, Saul, I really think I gotta take a number two. Yeah, there's a tide window. I'm not missing it. The Nazi drill instructor was probably more what I'd become. Yeah, I'm gonna give you four options, Larry. Four? I don't think I can count that high. Quit joking, Ivy. You listen to me or you're on your own. Ooh. This is Strawberry Island now. This is Washington Park and our trucks. 
And this is the Rosario Strait between us and home. Option one, this island back here has a cabin. We knock on their door, ask for help. Option two, we continue further to Orcas Island here. We stash the boats and take the ferry home. I'll get the boats another day. Three, this is the toughest option. We paddle back the way we came, three miles across the Rosario Strait. Now, I can do any of those, so you tell me which one you want to do. You don't tell somebody you've competed with all your life in a, in a variety of sports that I can do any of these. Which one do you want to do? I can do any of those too, so. What's he going to pick? He's going to pick the toughest one. You just told him which one was the toughest, and then he picked it. Let's paddle back. You sure? Yeah, man, paddle back. Bring it up. That was really stupid. What won out in the very end is the same thing that got us in trouble here. It's the same thing that's got us in trouble in other times. It's our competitive nature. If he can paddle across the channel, I can paddle across the channel. I can swim across it. I can cycle 150 miles if I want to. I can run a marathon. I don't care. He's the same way. But when we get us together, maybe we don't make the best decisions as a team. Larry and Saul are paddling into the jewels of an oncoming storm. Soon they will face 70 mile an hour gusts and a huge storm swell rolling in from the ocean. What we do you, man? Uh, looks pretty ugly. Yeah. Sure you're gonna be up for this? Yeah, I'm up for this. Are you up for this? We got 40 to 45 minutes to make this crossing before the current gets too strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Paddle hard. I'm not an idiot. The conditions now are dangerous. But if they don't move quickly, Larry and Saul will face far worse. In less than an hour, the tide will turn and all the water in the channel will surge out to sea, taking them with it. Rosario Strait is 20 miles wide of water, with the water cranking through there at a peak, faster than any of the rivers that we bother to measure, you know, the Mississippi, the Amazon, the Nile, any of those. So you just take, imagine the biggest river you've ever seen in your life and multiply it by five or six or seven. Hey, Saul! Hey, I'm taking on water here! There is a technique for paddling into waves that stops them splashing into the boat. Saul! But Larry doesn't know it. Hey, I'm still taking on water here! Is that normal? Look, Larry, are you watching me? Okay. I have been. Don't let the waves hit you side on. No. We'll minimize the water that goes into your boat. And dig with your paddle. Dig. Don't puncture the wave head on. Everything I'm telling him is just blah, 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 blah. It's a bunch of words. He ain't listening. He's, you know, he's confident at this point. He knows what he needs to do. And he's probably thinking to himself, Saul's full of crap. Dig with your paddle. Dig. Dig. Hey, I'm still taking on splash here. Larry. Do you understand anything I'm saying? Saul! Stabilizing strokes do you no good. Saul, I have never been in a kayak before, OK? You said that you had. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Well, that explains it. Explains what? You better learn and hurry. I am doing what I can. Yeah, well, quit. Just paddle like I tell you, OK? He's trying to get me to put my nose into the wave, pierce right through it, take on the least amount of water possible. Number one, I didn't have the skill to do that at the time because I still was learning how to kayak, essentially. But number two, the waves were, were coming all the time. The closer they get to the middle of the channel, the more their progress is slowed by wind and waves. And now the powerful tidal current is pushing them dangerously off course. This current is going to suck us out to sea! Do you understand? Saul, I think I'm sinking. 
Jeez, you just I got am, to... okay? I'm trying. We haven't moved ten feet in the last ten minutes, man. I could sense some panic in his voice. He knew that we had a limited amount of time to get across the channel. We hit a point where when it got really rough, just all our forward progress stopped. I mean, you know, 20 minutes, we were roughly halfway. 40 minutes, we were roughly halfway. An hour, we were roughly halfway. At this point, Larry's boat is so full of water, it weighs over a ton and is impossible to maneuver. Larry, damn it, your shoulders are slack. Okay, Final. okay. Balance strokes do you no good! Hey! Forward! Okay! Paddle! Okay! 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 Are no, 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 you a complete idiot? Back off! Okay, I am trying! Blood pressure is definitely cranking up there. I figured that it was a good possibility that we could get killed. I was starting to have these doubts in my mind that we were gonna be able to stick together. Your loyalty is to your friends, but then your first loyalty is to yourself. Soul, get the hell back here! You're slowly getting to this decision. It's not an easy decision to get to. So wait up! The key for my survival and even his survival was that I make it to shore and get help. Soul! Soul! I need that pump! You need to bring me the pump! He's yelling something to me. I'm yelling back to him. I yell at him, I'm going to get help. I'm assuming he can hear me. He's probably assuming I can hear him. We really can't hear much of anything. I mean, at the time, I was so focused on the pump, I wasn't focusing in on the fact that he essentially was abandoning me. So I, need pump. Bring me the pump. I can't see Saul anymore. He's gone. He's just not there. You don't leave your buddies. You don't leave your friends behind. I love the guy, but... He left me. I was just applying as much speed as I could. Just crank it. The faster you can get to somebody to get them to help him, that's the only thing that's going to work. And I was getting more nervous because I've got this big phobia about being swept farther and farther towards the ocean. The ocean's very big. You know, there's lots of mean things out there that will do bad things to you. I'm very aware of two things. The current is moving Larry further and further away. We got darkness at, you know, 3.30, quarter to 4, 4 o'clock in that range. I need to phone. I need to call 9 one My boat was completely full of water at that point. My feet were covered, my shins were covered, it was coming up my legs. And that's when I started to get that sense of panic. And I knew, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. This big wave just cracks down and everything stopped. One moment I'm here in this boat full of water, and a second later, I'm outside the boat treading water, just like that. Less than an hour before dark, 
Larry is in the middle of the three mile wide Rosario Strait. The tidal current is sweeping him away from land and into open water. I'm in the water now. Not a fun feeling. Looking down and not seeing my feet, not seeing my shins, not seeing my knees, I'm getting scared at that time. Each, each minute is just, it's like some critical mass building and building and building, and it's, it's not getting any better. It's just, it continues to get worse. It's getting dark, and there's no one here to not only save me or rescue me, but no one knows where the hell I'm even at. I'm starting to have some self-doubt. Did I make the right decision? Where is Larry? Is Larry alive? Did I just consign my friend to death? What do we do? I mean, what are my options at this point? His kayak contains vital supplies, fresh water, flares, and a flashlight. But Larry can see the shore, and it doesn't look far. What he doesn't realize is that if he swims, he'll be fighting against a current moving twice the speed that the fastest human can swim. At some point, I'm gonna have to leave this boat because I'm going nowhere with this boat right now. It's getting me zero. I'm gonna, I'm gonna swim. So I take off and leave the boat. dry suit on. It's end of November. It's cold, but that doesn't throw me. I'm telling myself, I'm an athlete. I can do this. This is no big deal. It's just that Mother Nature and her little currents, they had a whole nother thing to say about that problem. It's been an hour since Larry capsized. Now, a full-scale rescue operation is underway. But without the lights or flares from his kayak, Larry is all but invisible. I wish I would have grabbed the flashlight I had taped to the bow of my boat, which I didn't do. If I would have grabbed that flashlight, I probably would have been saved in half an hour. I'm looking around, and I can see kind of, you know, boats out there. They're like crisscrossing back and forth. Help! Help me! Here! Hey! And I started thinking, I bet they're looking for me. Help! I must have looked like nothing in the water to these people. Hey, over here! Here! Here. I'd go down in a swell and come up. You know, they're always just right back searching where I just was. Not only was I a small person in a very big place, I was also a very vulnerable person in a very, very big place. I was thinking, okay, I know me, I know Larry. If there's people that can survive for a long period of time just by being stubborn and being fit enough, we fit that description. Several miles away, a rescue team is scanning the shoreline in the hope that Larry might have made it to one of the islands. Bravo 6, we have a visual on a red kayak on Burroughs Island. As soon as I heard that they were, you know, that they'd spotted the kayak, it was just happiness. It was like, oh, great, Larry's fine. He's there, he landed the boat.
Is there a paddle with the boat? Affirmative. So he paddled it onto shore. And uh, any gear with the boat? Negative, empty. No sleeping bag, dry bag, nothing. Correct, the boat's empty. <laughs> Great. He's on that island somewhere. What more clues could you need? I mean, paddles with the boat, sleeping bag's gone. The guy's alive. He's somewhere here in the bushes. Just got to find him. Yes! You've never seen somebody so excited in his life at this point. I'm happy. I'm going, good. This is a good time to call his parents and let them know what's going on. Mr. Kaiser? Yes, it's Saul Kanderis. Uh, well, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but Larry, he's going to be OK. We, we think he's on an island somewhere, probably in the woods. The Coast Guard now concentrate on searching the island. But out to sea, Larry is still swimming hopelessly against the current. I'm in trouble. I'm being sucked with the current down a channel. I could head out to the Pacific here any time. I saw a buoy off to my right. I'm thinking, I'm going to see if I can maybe latch onto this buoy and not get drug out to the ocean. Kind of put my head down, I started swimming again. I started kind of cutting diagonally across to get to the buoy. Head down, swimming away. I'd look up to kind of see where, where I was going. I was already past the buoy. The current has got me by the balls here right now, and it's, I'm, I'm being pulled this way. And that's when everything changed. It's, it, it went from survival, you know, I'm gonna, I'm big, strong swimmer, I'll get across, to, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna get out of this. Eight hours since he capsized, Larry is nearly four miles out to sea. But the Coast Guard is still searching the island where they found his boat. Because they found a paddle with it, they assume he must have paddled to shore. What they don't know is that Saul equipped the kayak with a spare paddle. Our best hope is that uh, he'd be on the island right now. Larry, he paddled here. He left a red paddle with his boat. Did you say red paddle? The red paddle is the storm paddle. It's tied to the boat. The boat with nobody in it would still have the red paddle. Did you say red paddle? Yes. No black and white paddle. No. Are you near the boat? Yes. How many holes are in the, the top of the boat? Two, one for each person. No, no, it's a, it's a one-man kayak. That's a storage hatch. Is there anything in there? Yes, there's gear in here. A dry bag with what feels like clothes and maybe oh. a sleeping bag. He's not on the island. Damn it! At this point, I'm really going, man, we're in trouble. <laughs> I really screwed up. <laughs> He's dead, and we're going to find the body. You realize that somebody that you're fairly close to is no longer here, and you're the one that killed him. Just an incredible sense of no hope again. Just no, it, it's all over. It's all over. Why did I invite him on this trip without making sure that we're both ready for this trip? It's almost like saying, what the hell was I thinking? Yes, Mrs. Kaiser, that's Saul Kanderis. I'm sorry to call you so late. It, w it was the hardest phone call I've ever made. It was uh, nothing that in my life I'd ever expected myself to have to do was call somebody and say, hey, I just went out with your, your, your son and did something. And as a result of doing something, he's dead. You know, I took your son out, it was supposed to be fun. I got him killed. 
Shortly after midnight, the Coast Guard call off the search. They assume that in the morning, they will be looking for Larry's body. At that point, I was fully thinking, there's just no chance in hell I'm ever getting out of this water alive. Exhausted, Larry's body temperature is now so low, his life is in danger. If he doesn't start swimming again to get warm, he'll die. I really thought, just end it now. Why even bother with this? I thought about, you know, trying to essentially drown myself. You think about weird stuff like that. And that's when we started thinking about my mom. And I love my parents, I love my dad, I love my family. <laughs> what do you say? Um, you know, thanks for you know being my mom, quote unquote. I mean. I, I was ready to die. It's, it's not an issue. I didn't want them to feel that, that suffering and pain, though. You know, and not know what happened to me. That's where I made that decision to try to somehow say my own sorry. But as I'm continuing down, I can see this lighthouse coming off to my right as I'm coming up on it. And it's, it seemed like I'd gotten a little closer to land from where I was at. I, I was in the middle of the channel when I first started. And I kind of came to this lighthouse. And I, you know, it, it looked closer. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I can maybe get that. I can maybe swim for that. The tide is sweeping Larry towards the Pacific. But by sheer luck, a side current carries him within striking distance of the last available piece of dry land. And I start swimming, and it's getting closer. And keep swimming, it's getting closer and closer. I'm like, I'm gonna make this. My God, thank you. You know, thank you, Lord. I come up onto shore and there's this big rock right there and I just swim up and put my arms around this rock. This is the most beautiful rock I've seen in my life. That's all I could think of. No one else, no, nothing else, just, just lie there and enjoy this rock, this stupid rock that was my buddy at the time. Feeling of, of relief, you know, I mean, Everyone knows what, what relief is, but I, if you've ever been in a situation where it, it's literally life and death, and you feel that you've cheated death that one time, it doesn't get much sweeter than that. Larry Kaiser has survived nine hours in a freezing ocean. 
Now, exhausted and dehydrated, he faces an even more desperate fight to stay warm on land. I'm cold. It's dark. I have no idea where I'm at. I thought about, what the hell is Saul doing right now? What's he thinking right now? What is this man thinking? Is he thinking that I'm dead? Is he thinking he killed me? Is he thinking he's responsible for killing me? The big difference between him and I is there's just not a chance in hell I would leave someone like that. I wouldn't do that. No matter what happens, if, if the person I'm with is going to die, I will die with them. Four hours ago, the Coast Guard assumed Larry was dead and called off the search. Saul is haunted by his decision to leave his friend behind. It wasn't an easy decision to say, hey, I'm just going to leave Larry. It was a survival decision. The key for my survival and even his survival was that I make it to shore and get help. Mike. Mike. What? What time in the morning did they start the search again? We did what we could, okay? You did what you could. Nobody's going to blame you. What time? I don't know. Probably first light, 5.15. Okay. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Larry assumes he's on the mainland. <laughs> Now, in daylight, he thinks he can walk to the lighthouse he saw the night before and get help. At that point, to me, in my mind, absolutely the worst was over. There's no way I'm going to succumb to anything within the next, you know, 24 hours or something like that, unless Bolt of Lightning comes down and nails me. I'm thinking, what is this? I'm on an island right now. And it's another mile across to get to land again. What's the first thing they tell you to do when you're lost? You know, tell you to stay put. I don't see any helicopters. I don't see any planes. I don't see anything. So I just figured they'd given me up for dead and I'm on my own again. What am I going to do? Just stand here at some stupid island and stand here the rest of my life? <laughs> it's not going to work. I'm not Tom Hanks. I got to go out and get going here, for God's sake. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm an athlete. I can do this. I can swim that. I'm going to swim. To reach the lighthouse, Larry faces another mile in freezing water. Already dehydrated and hypothermic, he will again be at the mercy of the area's lethal currents. I'm swimming across the water. I'm literally right in the middle. I stop swimming. I turned around in the water, and there behind me, where I was standing for the previous hour, was this giant helicopter, 50 feet up above the, above the shore, right where I was standing. You've got to be kidding me. You know, you have to be kidding me. This can't be happening. Why can't I get rescued? I mean, why can't they see me? As time went by and we hadn't found Larry, 
I had more and more doubt as to whether or not I made the right decision. Not only did you get your friend killed, but it's proof you're a failure. Can't you do anything right? Is there anybody here? Hello? Is anybody there? The lighthouse. It was uninhabited. Everything I do is not the right decision. Hello? At that point, I felt like I was floating in a dream or a nightmare. You know, hope has been slowly draining away and uh, feeling really depressed. I got him killed. Nobody else got him killed, I did. At 11.35 a.m., a rescue helicopter spots Larry and rushes him to the Ana Cortez Hospital ER. Then the helicopter kind of flies overhead and the guy there crewing the station just jumps up and says, God, great news for you. He said, they picked your friend up and they're taking him to the hospital and he's okay. Man, was I happy never seen somebody so happy in his life like okay where's the hospital where's the hospital where's the hospital where's the hospital nope. I remember seeing him walk into the room that I was at and you could tell without him verbalizing his feeling you know Larry you okay? Lift. Yes, Saul. I felt good having Saul there, but you don't leave your buddy. It's not correct. It's not. It's just not right to leave someone like that. You must. You have... left me. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm just glad you're all right. Yeah, me too. With who I am, I wanted him not to feel guilty. I wanted him to hopefully be relieved in the fact that I'm OK. Do I hold a grudge against him for, for doing that? No, I don't. It's just one of those things, you know, it's like, yeah. The main thing I remember is being so happy to see him. It was like better than any Christmas present is your buddy's still alive. 10 years after their misadventure, Saul and Larry remain friends and have even kayaked together in the San Juan Islands. But they never discuss what happened nor can they agree if Saul's decision to leave his friend behind was the right thing to do.